I call this meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order, and I note that a quorum is present. Our first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from Monday, March 13th, 2023. Uh, Vice Chair Edelson, can I get a motion? Um, yes, my motion is to move those minutes, Madam Chair. Great. Any discussion to the motion? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. And we have two bills on the agenda for today. So the first is House File 1278. So Representative Pulowski, uh, glad to, well, this is your committee, so glad to see you move from that side to the testifier table. So would you please move that House File 1278 be re-referred to the General Register? Uh, so moved, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And you can go ahead and present your bill, Representative Plowski. Madam Chair, members of the committee, House File 1278 would put $40 million into the disaster contingency account upon the uh, signature of uh, this bill. The account is down to 700000 We would anticipate in a normal spring two to three million dollars worth of disaster aid in a normal spring. This does not look like a normal spring. The 40 million would hopefully replenish the account uh, for the next two years. And that's the bill, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Plowski. Discussion to House File 1278. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And. Uh, and Chair Pawlowski, I know that this, you've been working on this for a long time and I've been putting in. When was the last time we replenished this account? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, we replenished the account in a rather curious way in the last legislative session by a Senate proposal to take money out of a transit account in the metropolitan area that was overflowing. It was not a method that I concurred with and I think is sloppy, legislating, and dangerous. If this account is depleted and we are not in session, then the governor would have to call a special session. And I want to remind the committee that there is nothing special about a special session, particularly relating to a disaster. Thank you. Further discussion to House File 1278. Seeing none, final word. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You did. Hi. Good Hi. to see you, Representative Garofalo. Well, good to see Lee you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Pulowski, thank you for bringing this bill forward. I'll repeat my comments I did from a couple years ago, and that is that it's always good we can take care of this stuff individually, show people we can work together. But more importantly, I think I speak on behalf of the chair and this whole committee when we're just honored to have your positive and sunny disposition before this committee. That's what we <laughs> appreciate the most. So, Madam Chair, I'll be voting yes on this. Thank you. Thank you. So, Representative Pulowski, final word to your bill. Um, Madam Chair, um, please support the bill. Uh, this is our only way of dealing with disasters. Thank you. And with that, Representative Pulowski renews his motion, motion that House File 1278 be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. The motion prevails and House File 1278 has been re-referred to the General Register. And the next bill on the calendar today is House File 2286, right. Representative Knorr. <laughs> Good morning, Representative Knorr. And I will have you move that House File 2286 be re referred to the General Register so that we. Ha is that your motion, Representative? That's my motion, Madam Chair. Great, and you do have a series of amendments here, so we'll kind of walk through this slowly to make sure we, we get this done correctly, and we have the wonderful Mr. Berg with us today that I'm sure can speak to everything we need him to as needed. And so the first amendment we have is the A4 amendment. Um, do you want to comment on that first, or would you like us to also go to the A5 amendment? Uh, we'll go through A4 amendment initially, and then we'll go to A5 Okay, next. so could you please explain the A4 amendment, Representative Knorr? Uh, Madam Chair, the A4 amendment removes incentives uh, program for the navigators, which was supposed to go to 100 hours. It also removes the continuous coverage for kids, which we intended to include in this bill. Uh, Madam Chair uh, and members, this adds Minnesota Care as part of the Minnesota Public Health Program as part of the medical assistance. Uh, in relation to the health care and winding. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, this gives permission to the com Commission to suspend procedural um, termination 
based on Center for Medicaid uh, Services. It also waives uh, Minnesota care premiums uh, from May 1, 2023 to June 2024. It also deletes the appropriation sections. It makes changes to the previous uh, unspent navigator sister program. It provides appropriation for the unwinding of the continuous eligibility. So basically this is more about accounting. Uh, it's really complex and complicated when it comes to balancing that process, Madam Chair. That's the AFO amendment. Okay, great. Do you want to do discussion on that or would you like to move the A5 as it relates to the A4? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move A5. Uh, so uh, we will move the A5 amendment and can you please describe, Chair Nor will move the A5 amendment and could you please describe that? Uh, Madam Chair and members, the A5 uh, appropriates uh, funding for the Minnesota care uh, premiums. Uh, we are also making sure that the tribal processing entities are included when it comes to processing the healthcare coverage. It also makes appropriation accounting for the Nav Navigator program. And that is essentially uh, what the A5 amendment will do. Thank you, Representative Norris. So just to be clear, we have the A4 amendment in front of us and the A5 is amending the A4 in which you have both described. So we'll move to discussion of the A5 amendment to the A4 amendment. Discussion to the amendment to the amendment. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Representative Noor, thank you again, or Chair Noor, thank you again for all your work on this. It's, it's so important um, after the public health emergency that we have the resources to the Department of Human Services to make sure that they can, uh, you know, they have to reevaluate all these people to see if they're still eligible for, for our programs. And uh, it's going to be a huge, huge job. And thank you so much for doing this. My only real question is, um, there was some discussion about trying to line up with the Senate, and is that kind of what you're doing here, or to what, if you could just say to what degree you are or are not, that would be very helpful to me. Thank you. Madam Chair and members, I think this has been a journey over the weekend, and also on Friday, <laughs> until 1 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I think Mr. Bag will tell you that. Uh, so the changes we're making aligns us with the Senate, and we're making sure that the accounting process, because this is more about which uh, funding stream, how we allocate the funding is really aligned with the Senate. And then the MMB came in and that's why we have uh, A6. They said, you can do this, uh, which is try to appropriate funding that was unspent in 2022. So that's part of the whole conversation to make sure that when we come to the floor with this bill, it's ready because this is a really urgent bill. Um, effective April 1, the unwinding process starts and we are supposed to send the, the plan to the federal government so that uh, we have a plan to start the unwinding. So that takes us to the A6 amendment, which will be uh, uh, making it even more correction to the accounting process. That's right. Further discussion, Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just wondering what this newfound love for aligning everything with Senate language is here in this body. Um, we're an independent body. Um, I don't think it's something that we need to aspire to doing. Um, and I am, it's, it's like, I've never seen it like this before, where every day the, the big talking point is, oh, we're, we're aligning our language with the Senate. Big flipping deal. We used to have conference committees. Those were the things, you know, that where some of this stuff got hammered out. And I'm, I'm really getting really weary of hearing about how wonderful it is to align everything with the Senate. Those are just my comments, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scott. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And on the A4 Amendment, uh, Representative Nora, first of all, thank you for reaching out to me this weekend uh, to explain <clears throat> the substance of these amendments. I do appreciate that. Um, can you explain, why are we waiving all Minnesota care premiums all the way until June of next year? Representative Nor. Madam Chair and members, um, if you recall the, the federal uh, FFCRA uh, allowed us to do the continuous coverage. That meant we included uh, Minnesota here as part of the, uh, the coverage for medic medical assistance and also the, the continuous eligibility. As of right now, that has already been suspended. As we do the unwinding process, when we move people from Medicaid to Minnesota care, we're trying to make sure that we have a safe landing process, but also allows us to do the unwinding in a way that we don't exclude people 
from the healthcare coverage. So this is more about providing continuous coverage for those who are already in Minnesota care. And Madam Chair, thank you, Madam Chair, and Representative Noor, and I respect that, but why does it have to be free? Representative Noor. Madam Chair, members, uh, the Minnesota Care is our basic health care program for the state of Minnesota. And so essentially, uh, as we do the unwinding, we're moving people from one program to the other. And we've been given up to, uh, you know, 12 months to do that unwinding. I think it's up to 14 months to complete the process. So this gives us the time uh, because we are trying to make sure that this process, this is more complicated. This has never been done uh, since uh, ACA. This is a huge undertaking. It's about 1.5 million Minnesotans who will go and undergo this process. It impacts everyone. 40% of those who will be impacted are kids in the state. 40% of the state kids are on Medicaid program or some sort of Minnesota care. So this is really essential for us to get it right. That means if we don't do it right, many people may not get their care, they may lose their coverage, and this also may result in other unintended consequences for us to take advantage of the time frame. In fact, there's an incentive that we're getting from the federal government uh, for the additional FMAP increases, which I'll be covering when I do the bill. So it's already funded. Um, let me put it this way. In the previous cycle, when we had the FFCRA, we had almost close to $2 billion, $2 billion that we got from the federal government to do the continuous coverage. With now that the unwinding process starting, we will get up to $300 million by the end of the year. It's 5% next quarter, followed by 2.5 and 1.5. So the funding is already coming from the federal government for us to implement this program. So this is a small piece of the pie when it's $5.329 million to support Minnesota care uh, enrollees. Madam Representative Chair. Graffalo. Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Berg, can you dumb it down a little bit for this dumb network engineer over here? Because I... Uh, I thought we had Minnesota care premiums before the COVID emergency. Uh, can you just kind of walk me through it? Is, uh, is this an extension of the COVID emergency policy, or is this more in line with the policies we had pre-COVID? When, when it comes to the issue, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, with, with regards to um, the pre Minnesota care premiums. Mr. Berg. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Gar Garofalo, there are statutory premiums and have been in Minnesota care. Um, we have, in my memory, adjusted the premiums up or down. Uh, the, this gets rid of the premiums for a temporary period that you mentioned, the fiscal 24. After that, the premiums would go back in place if there's not other law to change it, but the, uh, it, it would revert to the current statutory uh, position after fiscal 24. Um, does, does that answer yeah. your question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sufficiently dumbing it down for me. I appreciate it. Well, I hate health care. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Further discussion to the A5 amendment. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I thank you again, uh, Chair Noor. I, I just wanted to kind of add the, the, the reminder, too, that, and that, that um, and it isn't the reason for the removing the premiums, as Chair Noor just explained. However, you know, people on Minnesota Care, the upper limit for income is 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, I don't know, Chair Noor, maybe you know uh, offhand like how much that is, but it's not much. We're talking about very low income people. So it's not like, uh, I mean, Again, that we do charge them premiums. They do pay on a sliding scale and so on under normal conditions. But I, I just wanted to kind of put that context around this. I don't know if Chair Newark cares to say any more about that, but it is important to remember who we're talking about. Thank you. Representative Noor, did you want to comment on that? Um, Madam Chair, I think Chair Liebling is right. Uh, this is the folks who are under 200% federal poverty guideline. In fact, some of them, because of their sliding scale, they don't pay those premiums. So this is more of a safety net for us. And through this process, we took the action of making sure that we can provide that continuous coverage for those individuals who are in Minnesota care. This is a temporary. It's going to start, uh, we will start collecting the premiums. In fact, there were some conditions set for us to receive the additional uh, federal medical assistance percentage. That 6.2% that we were receiving was a condition 
for us that we keep people at the same level for that period of the continuous eligibility. So this is more of also being aligned with what we had already started doing during the, uh, the pandemic. Further discussion, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Knorr. Um, just looking between the, the original bill language and the uh, amendments here, just wondering what effect or impact um, the, the grants that go to counties is. We know in the unwinding process that counties are going to be carrying the bulk of the work for this. And so I know you've been working with the counties to figure out the right number. I'm just wondering if that was changed in here at all. Representative Knorr. Madam Chair and members, nothing has changed. In fact, that's the number that the counties came to me with, and we kept that number. We're just making sure that uh, because we are using the percentage of individuals uh, enrolled in uh, medical assistance, so that, in essence, includes the tribal government. So we made sure that we make that small, tiny correction because that was an omission. So the number stayed the same. Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Knorr. That, um, Thank you for that answer. The, the other question I had in here was for the central office appropriation, uh, the $7 million uh, from the Healthcare Access Fund for technology system cost changes. Um, I, from what I understand with what the counties are going to have to do, a lot of it's going to be by paper, and we had that discussion in committee before on that. So just wondering what technology is going to be changed in this. Representative North. Madam Chair and members, I think uh, there will be changes in the MAXIS system, which is the eligibility system that we have, the MET system that we use for uh, at the county level to process some of this, but also in the MMIS. So this is more of things that were paused during the pandemic, and now we're starting to pick up those changes. So that means there is additional change requires in all those systems so that the county workers and those who are also using other systems are able to process the eligibility. So this is much needed at this point. It's a small um, increase. As you can see, we also have a small portion that I think we'll be getting from the federal government to cover some of the FFP offset as part of the big unwinding piece. Thank you. Further discussion of the A5? Okay. Seeing no further discussion, we're going to uh, move the A5, which is the amendment to the A4. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails and the A5 is adopted. And we have one more amendment to the A4, which is the A6 amendment. So Representative Knorr moves the A6 amendment to the A4. Would you like to uh, describe the A6 amendment, uh, Representative Knorr? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, still trying to make sure that we have the appropriate accounting. Uh, what we're removing is the capture of that unspent funding and uh, making sure that we're more aligned. This is a request that came through from MMB so that we don't proceed with that. So we are actually removing that section and spending the amount through the budget change you have, the sheets that in, is in front of you. Discussion to the A6 amendment. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the A6 amendment to the A4 is adopted. And so we have now the A4 amendment as amended in front of us. Any discussion to that? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor of the A4 amendment as amended, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. No. no. The motion prevails and the A4 amendment as amended is adopted. And so to your bill as, adopt, as amended, Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I know I noted that county can get complex, but let me tell you this. The healthcare system that we have and the work that is going to be done by the counties and the DHS and the navigators is more complex. This is unprecedented. This is a huge undertaking for the entire state. As I noted, 1.5 million Minnesotans will be impacted. As Representative Schumacher indicated, this is going to be a paper process to making sure that everyone that who did not do their renewal for the past three years will now have to go through the renewal process. This means 40% of these kids in the state of Minnesota will be impacted. If we don't do this, if we don't do it appropriately, Many people will go with no care at all. The preventative care that we have, 
the services that they could be getting, the long-term care, the nursing homes, everyone will be impacted. More than 13% of Minnesotans will lose their coverage. Unfortunately, 13%, almost 200,000 Minnesotans will lose their coverage. The safety net that we had with the continuous coverage, we increased the number of individuals who are covered by 300,000. I, I wish we could keep the same. Unfortunately, we will not do that. So what this bill does is make sure, number one, we provide funding for the department to make sure that we have got a system that is functional and ready to support Minnesotans across the state. The other piece that we're going to be doing is the continuation of the Minnesota care so that individuals don't have to pay the premium. It's 5.329 million. This also will ensure that we suspend the periodic uh, processing, you know, data and everything else because we're putting a stop to make sure that we complete the unwinding process without any interruption because we have until 14 months to complete that process. We're also taking care of those who are elderly, disabled, those who are blind, because their assets have grown in the last three years. The asset limit for those individuals is 3,000 an individual and 6,000 per couple. So what we're doing here is we're disregarding their assets for 12 months from the day that we do the unwinding, whereby they will continue to receive Medicaid while they have got that asset limit, they're spending down. I wish you could have seen how that is complicated for the uh, seniors and individuals in the system. Spend down is one of the most complicated. They have to take into account the entire assets, the securities that they have, their, their homes, and so many other things. Looking into that, we make sure that seniors continue to have coverage. Within this bill, Madam Chair and members, we are authorizing the commissioner to continue to have some additional safeguards. The CMS guidance keeps on changing. So we wanna make sure that the commissioner has the authority to implement those changes as we do the unwinding. Madam Chair and members, as I noted, this is not only about the state, it's also about the counties and also the tribal government who are going to be processing this. We're providing funding for them. We're also providing funding for a vital group of individuals who are known as navigators. They help individuals across the state to be able to maintain their eligibility by helping them with personal assistance, getting them through the system, and ensuring that we don't lose anyone in that process. Madam Chair and members, this is much needed bill. It's an urgent bill. We need to be able to pass this bill by this week, if possible, to make sure that the state is able to send its plan to the CMS by the end of this month. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I have uh, you know, a great uh, financial analyst here, uh, Doug Bug, who is going to cover this uh, uh, section of the appropriation. Thank you. Mr. Berg, and I'll just note, we did get uh, the sheet handed out in committee that tracks with, I believe, what Mr. Berg is going to be speaking to. So, Mr. Berg. Madam Chair, members, yes, the, there have been several versions of this. The one that was handed out this morning uh, that has a time stamp of today at 9.54 a.m. in the lower right-hand corner is the correct one. It also references the A6 amendment. <clears throat> and. Uh, to go in summary, the upper section lines one through seven are the general fund portion of this. The total general fund, on uh, net general fund on line seven is 57,490,024 and 1.064,025, and uh, a total of 58.554 million. Um, that goes for medical assistance, the administration, there's detail of that on lines 15 through 23, uh, along with lines three systems. The grants to counties are on line four, and then the federal offset on the administrative cost on line six. And then on lines nine through 12 is the healthcare action, access fund portion. Uh, the total spend from the healthcare access fund is 10 million two hundred and sixty five thousand in 24 uh, And that goes for both uh, as representative North said uh, Minnesota care on 11 to replace the the premium loss 
and then uh, the grants to navigators for the increased work they'll have on this. Um, and Madam Chair, I can answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Berg. Okay, great. So we'll go to member discussion now that we've walked through everything. Any discussion to House File 2286 as amended? Representative, I'll well, make sure we'll go to Gomez first. I'll come to you last. Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to Chair Noor for bringing this forward. Um, it is super confusing. I, don't, I think I understood like 40% of uh, the discussion so far, but I just um, want to talk, want to say a couple things. Um, you know, I was uh, lucky enough to, or unfortunate enough to be pulled into the HHS world in the last couple of years, and I was on the conference committee um, because of my work on homelessness. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I I know from my personal experience because my my child, my family has has benefited from. Um, from public programs, from economic supports through my life as a young person, and then, you know, my when when I was pregnant and when I had my kid, um, we were also on uh, on MA, so we were basically on Medicaid. Um, so that the the burden that um, just keeping up with the applications presents for families, especially, you know, families who are living in poverty. I think a lot of us who are in this body are lucky enough to have never experienced severe poverty ourselves. Um, as adults especially and the administrative burden of it just the stress the stress of, of, of living in poverty I think that we 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 sort of gloss over it a lot especially when you have little ones those of us who have kids like we know that even if you have kids even if your like finances are on point you still are spending all of your time stressing out about your kid right so we have to imagine what it's like to have your child not have medical coverage, to not know where your next meal is coming from, to come up short with rent, and to understand that in order to access some of these programs, we're having people, you know, submit um, financial information and 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 sort of reapply monthly. And what I was shocked about was that when when you um, make eligibility a little easier, when you say, oh, you instead of providing um, you know, financials every month, you do it every six months. It has this enormous cost because that cost, because there are families who are eligible, but who, who missed a piece of paper in their application. And so they're off and on and off and on of the, on these programs. And Representative Noor talked about 300,000 Minnesotans who are going to lose coverage likely. And we have to, to think about what, and 40% of, of the people on this program are children. So what is the cost to our society of having little ones not going to get well child checkups, not catching medical problems because they don't have access to preventative care? What is the cost in emergency department admissions? What is the cost in lifelong health impacts? Um, you know, so, so I guess I, I, I'm just really grateful for this and I hope that as we're moving through this and I know that this has been a priority of Chair Liebling and the other leaders in the health and human services space is to take a look at like this, the balance between making sure that people who are enrolled in our economic support programs are eligible but also being mindful of the administrative burden of maintaining eligibility sometimes when you have to submit um, you know your application materials every month and that's like one of your many 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 administrative tasks as a parent and especially as a low-income parent and so if, if you are in this body and you're lucky enough to have never had to figure out how to qualify for economic support programs because you were in deep poverty it's like we have to take a step back when we have these kind of measures in front of us and really think you know, because these are not, this is not abstraction. This is like not a number on a page. These are families and children, Minnesotans, who, you know, are just trying to maintain coverage, health, basic health coverage for their families. And so, you know, I just really thank Representative Noor, and I'm so grateful that he's here because his deep knowledge of this program and other economic supports that are low in most neediest families have to access, I just think is a real asset to this body. And, um, you know, again, I just hope that those of us who haven't been in it learn about it and, and really think when, we're, when we have these policy choices in front of us about what 
is the actual cost of having hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans, hundreds of thousands potentially of our babies, our youngest, not having access to basic medical care. So thank you, Chair Noor. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Representative Cleaborn. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Noor. I just wanna thank you also for bringing this bill forward. And um, Chair Gomez said most of what I wanted to say, but I think it's important for us to just be grounded in the fact that poverty uh, doesn't discriminate. Economic hardship doesn't discriminate. We have families all across our state in every district, including my own district of Plymouth and Medicine Lake, who desperately need these services. And I just wanna thank you for, as, uh, as Chair Gomez said, removing the administrative hurdles. It, they are, they would frustrate all of us at this table to try to apply for these programs. So thank you very much and I greatly appreciate and it, this bill and I encourage everyone to vote yes. Further discussion to the bill. Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Noor, um, you've said this and we've heard members of the DFL majority say this. Can you just walk us through why you believe that 300,000 people would lose uh, health insurance? Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chen, members. Um, I think as we know, uh, there's something called Medicaid Chan. What happens is someone who is eligible at one point may become ineligible at another point. So this process of Medicaid Chan will actually, because of the continuous coverage, we avoided it completely. So whether your income changed, your circumstances changed, whether you moved and we, you didn't get your mail, all those things were taken care of because of the continuous coverage. Now that we're starting to do renewals, that means individuals whose income is now higher will lose their coverage. Those who do not respond to the uh, application, if they did not respond, and by the way, as part of the condition of receiving that $300 million additional funding of the FMAP, we're supposed to make sure that we do everything to make sure that the mail and everything else is done appropriately. So with that, Professor uh, 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 Graffo, there will be a lot of people who will lose their coverage no matter what because of income, circumstances change, household changed, they moved, they didn't get their mail, and that's more statistics across the board. More than close to 70% of the people are not aware <laughs> of uh, that there is uh, the unwinding of the Medicaid because for the last three years, they've never done it at all. This is more of an <laughs> annual process. Knowing that we didn't do it for the last three years, we may lose individuals in that process. And based on Kaiser Foundation, I think 13 to 15 uh, percent, that gives us close to going to more than 200,000 individuals who could potentially lose their coverage. Now let me put it this way. If we're able to capture them, wherever they are, we may be able to you know, put them in the uh, uh, Minnesota care, or they may also get coverage to the Minshua uh, marketplace. So all those things play into the role of individuals who are going to receive um, their, um, their coverage effective April 1 next month. So, Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Representative Noor, uh, the 300,000 figure, and I wanna be clear, um, I don't think anyone wants to see kids lose health insurance and not have access to health service, but this, isn't this why we have Minsure? Isn't this why we have the advanced premium tax credits? Isn't this why we spend all the money on navigators so that these individuals can transition into the Minsure where our health systems are given the private pay reimbursement rates as opposed to the very low Minnesota care reimbursement rates? And by pushing and nudging and providing an incentive towards the Minnesota care system, aren't we in, in fact putting more financial pressure on our, on our health plans? Representative Noor. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Graffo, I think that's a major issue that we are supposed to be discussing because once you lose, I'll put it this way, more than 30% of black community, they go through that chat, no matter what, because of circumstances have changed and so many other things. More than 51.1% of black Minnesotans are on Minnesota public health care program. Yes, we have a lot of people who have got high poverty. Yes, we have got so many people who may not even be able to fill that form. 
So I gave you an example of individuals who may have high asset limit because if you're elderly, disabled, or blind, and your asset limit goes up, and you don't send up uh, your, your application because you believe that you'll not be re-enrolled. That's why we have to take the, the more proactive action right now to start bringing people in. And this is up to all of us, I think, as a representative for the entire state. We can take that first step and start encouraging our constituents to make sure their contact information is correct with the county, making sure that when they get the mail, they respond. Because if they don't respond, they lose their coverage. And if you lose your coverage, and the, the, pro the way the system is set up is more than three months, you don't have coverage, the system can only go back to three months. Guess what? If it goes more than a year or six months, people may discover that when they visit the hospital and when they need care, when they're more vulnerable. And that moment, that means they've got burden now. They've got a debt. And we all know what happens when people have got uh, Medicaid, uh, medical uh, debt. It actually impacts families significantly, especially those who are low income. So, Yes, there will be people who will lose coverage, and we need to be more proactive. And if we do more marketing and reach out, we may reduce the number of people who may not get covered. So it's up to us to put more efforts up front and to be able to make sure those who are eligible continue to receive the eligibility. So, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Representative Noor, you, you've convinced me. You've made the case that government is slow and there's a lot of red tape and bureauc bureaucratic. I, I got you now. You've, you've made the case to me. But again, I'll just say, isn't this why we're supposed to be nudging people towards Minsure and the advanced premium tax credits? Isn't that, isn't, doesn't that resolve the issue on an annual basis? Because losing their health insurance under um, whatever format, that triggers the availability to re-enroll in Minsure. They don't have to wait until the end of the year. The hospitals get a higher reimbursement rate, and this is what we're paying the navigators for. So the issue, I hear the problems you've mentioned, the problems with government red tape, isn't this why we should be using the navigation, nav navigator system we're funding to push people into Minsure? Representative Noor. Absolutely. I think we should take advantage of every uh, channel that we can use, whether it's the county, the navigators, or the department. We also have a dashboard at the department level to make sure that we, we look at the data of how many people are we re-enrolling, how many people are losing their coverage, and how can we reach out to them. So. The complexity is household circumstances may have changed, income may have changed, and many folks have never, they have never used the uh, Minsure uh, marketplace. And that's why we want to make sure that we were able to invest the small resources that we're doing today to increase that eligibility so that folks can move from one plan to the other, whether it's Minnesota Care or Minsure uh, marketplace. So that is the intent of this bill. Well, Madam Chair, and uh, um, I have concerns with the bill, and I'll be voting no today, but it, it, it seems like we've heard the foundation being laid here today for um, permanently removing premiums for Minnesota care. It what, seems like that's the direction it's going. I, we'll see what happens. Maybe the Senate will tell you to do it, and the House will accept. Maybe that's, maybe that's what will happen. Um, uh, on the flip side, uh, the, I continue to be in healthcare financing is complex. I don't pretend to understand all of it, but the feedback that we're getting is that the reimbursement rates for Minnesota care are so low that they want people who need subsidized health insurance, that our, our hospitals are much better off having people go through Minsure, that that's what's financially better for them because the reimbursement rates are so low. And it appears today that we are extending, incentivizing, and encouraging more people to stay in Minnesota care and Medicaid as opposed to moving into Minsure. And that's the part that I don't understand, and I'll have to do more research on. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no further member discussion, I'll go to Representative Knorr for final word on thanks for all your, your work on this uh, important bill. And if you want to give us your final comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think uh, thanks to all the members. This is about those who are most vulnerable Minnesotans. We're talking about someone who's making $3,000 for household of two when it comes to Minnesota care. We're talking about ensuring that they have continuous coverage and role. And based on the law that we drafted under the F4 amendment, it's clear that we're talking about May 1, 2023 to June 30, 2024. This is not continuous. It's just a temporary process. We know that we're receiving the additional federal funds. To be more specific, that we continue some of the process that we did and we're able to unwind. Members, the 
CAA, which is the uh, Consolidated uh, Appropriation Act, which was passed last year and signed by President Biden on the 29th of December, delinked the continuous uh, eligibility from the public health emergency. That was the first step. And now we have an opportunity as a state to ensure that every Minnesotan who is receiving medical assistance and Minnesota care are able to continue to have that coverage. We're able to do the work that people sent us to, uh, to, help, to do right here in this state of Minnesota. This is a small uh, resource compared to what we have received. And that's why you see all these numbers, you know, the numbers that we see in terms of the additional funds, the funds that we got from the federal government, the two billion that I discussed for the last uh, few years, including the 300 billion, 300 million dollars, it went all into the general fund. And now we wanna make sure that we take a small portion of that and ensure that the most vulnerable, the elderly, disabled, and the kids, and those who are low income can continue to have that coverage, that safety net. It's only about the coverage, nothing else. We're not talking about addressing the social determinants of health, we're not addressing anything else. It's the first step to make sure that people have got access to care. <clears throat> if I had the chance, I would have said every Minnesotan should have uh, universal health care, regardless, if I had the chance. But this is the smallest piece that we can do. I ask for your support. Thank you so much, I appreciate uh, your indulgence in this discussion. Thank you, Representative Noor. And with that, Representative Noor, uh, moves that House File 2286, as amended, be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails and House File 2286, as amended, has been re-referred to the General Register. And we have no more uh, business in front of us, but if members could just keep their ears on um, as we move forward in the week for potential meetings, that would be wonderful. And I'll be in contact with Lee Garofalo as the week progresses as well. And with that, we are adjourned.